I thus address the world through the medium of the latest wonderful invention, so that my voice, like my great show, will reach future generations and be heard centuries after I have joined the great, and as I believe, happy majority. Welcome to Becoming Barnum, the journey to fame and fortune, a podcast presented by the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and based on their award-winning blog series. Support for this project is presented to the Barnum Museum from the City of Bridgeport American Rescue Plan Act Funds, Peoples United, a division of M&T Bank, and the Connecticut Humanities and National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Federal American Rescue Plan Act. The Barnum Museum has a special treasure in its collection, a 750-page copybook of letters written by Phineas Taylor Barnum when he was traveling in Europe in the 1840s, introducing his young protege, General Tom Thumb, to high society and royalty, as well as millions of ordinary people. Barnum's lively letters to friends, family members, and business associates reveal him more completely as a person at times struggling mightily to make the three-year tour a success, all the while directing the management of his American museum from afar. They also offer insights into Barnum as a husband, father, and nephew, and as a mentor to the child actor-entertainer whose popularity resulted in their meteoric rise to fame and fortune. In his mid-30s at the time, Barnum proved himself a tireless go-getter, calculating risk-taker, and astute entrepreneur decades before his name was attracting crowds to the greatest show on earth. These letters offer a window into the hard-scrabble era of show business, revealing how Barnum went about acquiring, hiring, and commissioning attractions, and promoting his museum and the General Tom Thumb Tour in Europe. Join us as we travel back in time to learn, through Barnum's own words, about the real person behind the legendary P.T. Barnum. A touch of Yankee solves a problem. At the end of our last podcast, we left matters concerning General Tom Thumb's stop in Bordeaux, France, very much up in the air. Mr. Barnum was infuriated by the demands of the hospice commissioners, who expected a far larger percentage of the gross receipts than Barnum felt reasonable. They were asking much more than he had paid in Paris, or in any other place for that matter, and moreover, he claimed it would actually cost the general more money to perform there if they insisted on their 25% and the theater getting another 20%. Barnum threatened to bypass Bordeaux and go on to another town, which would mean the commission losing all income from the taxes Barnum would have paid, even if it was at a lower rate. And yet, it didn't sound like Barnum was ready to give up his plan to wow the Bordelais, that is, the citizens of Bordeaux, as he referred to them. There were hints he was working on a plan to best the commissioners. So, who triumphed in the end? As it turns out, we get quite a story. Barnum had learned some of the history of Bordeaux, and upon finding out there was actually a separate town or commune within the town, a solution to his dilemma unfolded. In a letter dated August 27, 1845, to My Dear Dignan, Barnum explained, Once upon a time, Bordeaux was a little village, and at that time the little village of Vassin only lay one half mile off. Bordeaux has continued to grow and increase, and at present it not only contains 11,000 souls, but it has also extended its boundaries and its dense population quite beyond Vincennes and completely surrounding it. Yet, singularly enough, ancient Vincennes has preserved her rights and independence, and is at present governed by her own mayor and municipal officers, although located almost in the heart of Bordeaux. The consequence is I have hired a spacious saloon in the commune of Vincennes, arranged with the hospice of Vincennes to pay it only 10 francs per day, and as there is no theater in that commune, I pay not a farthing for theaters, but snap my fingers and laugh at the theater and hospice of Bordeaux, 
for the saloon in Vincennes is as central as any saloon in Bordeaux proper. That is, strictly speaking, a Yankee trick. Barnum had described the situation to another correspondent, friend Huey, a few days earlier, noting, There is a magnificent garden and dancing saloon in Vincennes, only three-quarters of a mile from the center of the city. Thousands of people go there every Sunday. In fact, walk past it every day to promenade, and omnibuses run there from the center of the city for three sous. Confiding to Moses Kimball, Barnum's showman friend and competitor in Boston, he wrote, They are all crazy to see the general, and will do so at any price. So, to be revenged, I have fixed the price of admission at three francs each. It usually, outside of Paris, is two francs. And I'll raise hell here for ten or twelve days, and no mistake. There's plenty of money here, and I'll get a good bit of it. And learn the hospital directors a lesson they soon will not forget. Unable to resist a final boast, he added, I have given them a touch of Yankee. Although conceding that Vincennes might not have been as profitable as Bordeaux, Barnum was amply pleased with the general's success in Vincennes, and happier still to have taught these clever gentlemen a lesson. On September 1st, he told an unnamed correspondent, Our receipts for the last two days exceeded 6,000, which would have given the hospice over 600 according to my offer, and indeed over 800, for I doubt not we should have taken a couple of thousand more francs if we had been in Bordeaux. Whether independent or not, I never yet allowed a man nor a soulless corporation to swindle and impose on me whenever I could prevent it, at whatever sacrifice. At present, I can afford to make a sacrifice even of interest to will, and it has given me more than 10,000 francs worth of pleasure to think of what the feeling of these amiable gentlemen must be to see themselves thus caught in their own toils. Well satisfied with his clever trick, and the quantity of Napoleons, that is, French coins, rolling in, Barnum informed several of his correspondents that the entourage would next travel to Pamplona, Spain, two days' journey from Bordeaux. There, Barnum proudly declared they would meet her Spanish majesty and court, adding that the Spanish consul had intimated to him the queen's desire to see the general. Clearly, the tour was turning a profit once again, which was pure pleasure to the showman. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Atlantic in New York City, Barnum's American Museum was just three and a half years into the business, and its proprietor was striving to make it a highly competitive attraction, far more exciting than its previous iteration as Scudder's American Museum. Barnum hired a longtime friend, Fortis Hitchcock, to serve as the manager while he, Barnum, was in Europe. With increasing confidence in his museum manager, He asked Hitchcock to assume greater responsibilities, making decisions that would impact both the museum's profitability and brand, and even other investments. Barnum would, of course, advise Hitchcock and share his opinions on all these matters, but leave final decisions to his trusted friend. Despite the heavy demands of managing General Tom Thumb's tour, he had not relinquished his involvement in the museum. He was equally occupied with finding new museum attractions while in Europe, knowing that the mere hint that something had been acquired in Europe would be a draw to American audiences. In a minute, we'll see what's happening with the American Museum. An Awful Great Fire in New York Earlier, we left Mr. Barnum with plans to take General Tom Thumb and his entourage to Spain, where he eagerly anticipated an audience with the Queen, as well as introductions to the dukes and duchesses who would be with Her Majesty in Pamplona. While they journey forth, we will turn back to probe some other facets of Barnum's letters in the July to August 1845 time frame we've thus far been exploring. We've found some tantalizing comments that bear investigation, especially those concerning his American Museum and the state of things in New York City that summer. To make sense of the brief yet curious references in Barnum's communications with his business associates, Adrian St. Pierre consulted New York newspapers of that period to find out what was going on. You can read these newspapers by visiting the Library of Congress's online newspaper database. On a couple of occasions, Barnum mentioned the idea of purchasing Peel's collection as a backup, in case the American Museum's collection was consumed in a fire. 
What exactly did he mean by that? You may be familiar with the legacy of Philadelphian Charles Wilson Peale's artistically gifted family, and that two of his sons followed in their father's footsteps by also opening museums of science and art, located in New York and Baltimore. Reuben Peale's New York Museum opened in 1825, but began to founder after the Panic of 1837, and a few years later was taken over by bank directors. The story of that museum's demise gets complicated. Barnum ultimately leveraged a weakened competitor to drive traffic to his own museum. Suffice it to say that in 1845, when Barnum was floating the idea of purchasing another collection in case of loss of his own, he was already the owner of Reuben Peale's museum collection, which he had brought to the American Museum in late 1842. So, was Barnum now expressing interest in the older, more famous Peale's collection in Philadelphia, or another Peale's collection in Baltimore, owned by Reuben's brother, Rembrandt? Our curator Adrian's curiosity was piqued about the timing of the proposed backup plan, knowing, as we do with hindsight, that the American Museum eventually did burn to the ground, though a full 20 years later. Was this routine, practical thinking, that a fire was inevitable sooner or later, and so one should best be prepared to get back in business quickly? Writing to his Boston showman friend Moses Kimball on August 26th, Barnum confided, I am half glad that you will not want peels. I ought to buy it, for if the American Museum should burn down, I could not get peels probably short of $10,000 or $15,000 to replace my stock. As it turns out, fire was very much on people's minds in New York City in the summer of 1845, as a catastrophic event took place early in the morning of July 19th. Barnum did not receive that news for perhaps a full month, on August 19th, he wrote to an unnamed correspondent, There has been an awful great fire in New York. Luckily, it did not quite reach my museum. This was no ordinary fire in an era when fires were commonplace. The New York Herald published an extra on July 20th, 1845, to describe in vivid detail what happened along with providing an estimate of the losses, such as were known at that moment. The greatest, most terrible fire that has occurred in this city since the great conflagration of December 1835 has spread devastation throughout the lower part of the city. The losses were calculated to be between 5 and $10 million, a staggering amount at that time. According to the Herald, it appeared that the fire had broken out in a sperm oil store, whale oil was used for many purposes, and then spread to a chair factory. Like a hungry dragon, the flames spread quickly and consumed everything in their path. In very short order, the situation escalated into something far worse. According to the report, the fire was fueled by saltpeter, potassium nitrate, or more likely, some other more combustible materials that had been criminally stored in buildings, which set off massive explosions. The first building to blow up carried six or seven other buildings with it and shook the whole city like an earthquake. The concussion was so great as to smash more than half a million panes of glass in the neighborhood, to the extent of 200 yards distant. Across the East River in Brooklyn, many of the inhabitants felt their houses rock to the very foundation. Some say that the spire of Trinity Church shook for nearly a minute after the explosion. It was reported that one of two explosions near the start was caused by a reservoir of gas in New Street. Upon the bursting of the reservoir, the whole air was filled with a mass of living flame, which, in a few instants, attached itself in various places to the surrounding buildings. And from this circumstance mainly it was that the fire extended itself with so much rapidity. To add to the chaos, a fire engine had to be abandoned when it was buried by a fallen wall, its crew narrowly escaping. As spectators gathered, many people were injured or killed as a consequence of the fire's wild unpredictability and the explosions, with falling bricks and whole walls collapsing. In addition, furniture and trunks being thrown from upper-story windows in an effort to salvage possessions threatened the safety of people below. The tragedy and wreckage wrought by the fire was extreme. The Burnt District, as the Herald called it on their map sketch, 
covered the better part of about 12 blocks in Lower Manhattan, above the Battery, and extending up to Wall Street. The area was described as a blackened desert, so complete was the devastation. As Barnum noted to his correspondent, his museum had escaped damage, being six blocks further up Broadway at the corner of Ann Street. But it was a close call, and this event was sobering news indeed. Little did Barnum know at that point in his life how many times calamitous fires would come to affect his own life and fortunes, and that his own museum would burn not just once, but twice. An ironic twist to this story is that several years later, around 1850, Barnum and Moses Kimball purchased the Peel Collection in Philadelphia, and Barnum opened a museum there. It succumbed to fire the following year, though Barnum was no longer an owner when that happened. Next, let's learn more about the attractions Barnum was seeking to purchase in Europe with the hope of drawing ever larger crowds to his American museum. Manufactured Puffs and Dissolving Views Barnum's distance management of the American Museum while he was on a three-year tour in Europe had its ups and downs. He clearly reveled in seeking novel attractions that captivated London and Paris audiences with the idea of acquiring them at the lowest possible price and sending them to America. On the other hand, he must have found some of the management issues quite tedious, such as having to settle people's squabbles, those between his uncle and his museum manager being most aggravating, or, in the case of the feud with the giant and giantess, seek legal settlement of a contract dispute. To his great annoyance, Barnum also found that his museum manager, Fortis Hitchcock, a man in whom he placed great trust, was being unfairly attacked. In one letter, he alerted Hitchcock to the fact that he had been receiving packets of malicious letters from men who were attempting to destroy his reputation. Barnum realized their tales were lies and hastened to reassure Hitchcock that his faith was unwavering. He knew Hitchcock, a former minister, was a person of high principles. That was saying a lot at a time when dishonesty and duplicity in the course of doing business was all too common. However, in true Barnum style, he roundly chastises Mr. West, one of the editors of the New York Atlas, for failing to personally go to the American Museum so that he could see what he was being asked to applaud in a write-up. On August 16, 1845, Barnum wrote from Bordeaux, I have a word of complaint to make, and that is that you don't find time once in a while to peep into the museum and see what's going on. I know your taste lies with the theaters, but I have a good deal of pride in keeping up the old American Museum which gave me a start in the world, and although I do not need its profits, still do I mean to make it more and more worthy of public favor. Barnum was feeling annoyed by West's inattention, because he had invested money in a new attraction and wanted West to praise it in an editorial or article, a more effective way to persuade the public than advertising. He goes on, If you would just drop in an hour, one evening per week, whenever anything is new, you could scribble a few lines which would appear more like reality than all the manufactured puffs which could be written in a 12-month. The latest of new attractions? Dissolving views. Barnum explains, Those dissolving views and other fixins which Professor Swift is bringing out actually cost me in London between $2,000 and $3,000, and I think will please the public highly. Yet, I see they are not even mentioned in the atlas containing the advertisement of their first appearance. Although Barnum could rightly claim many popular entertainment firsts at his museum, the reference to the advertisement of their first appearance should be understood to mean at his museum, rather than the first time dissolving views had been shown. Ten months earlier, an ad for the Apollo Rooms appeared in the New York Herald, September 24, 1844, describing an exhibition of dissolving views. Quite a novel exhibition takes place this evening at the above room of a new instrument called the basenoscope, which exhibits a very humorous series of dissolving views. Articles in Baltimore, Maryland, and Alexandria, Virginia newspapers suggest that dissolving views were shown there in 1843 and 1844. Even a poem in praise of dissolving views was published several times in the newspapers. 
The phrase dissolving views brings to mind PowerPoint slides that have been formatted to dissolve as they transition from one to the next. But what were they in Barnum's era? Essentially, they were magic lantern presentations that utilized a biunial projector, that is, two lenses, and later a three lens projector. Simply put, the double or triple lens with a single light source allowed one hand-painted slide view to be gradually transitioned to another view. Popular subjects were landscape scenes that gradually transitioned from dawn to dusk or changed from fair weather to falling snowflakes. Other popular objects were celestial views and even gothic dramas, the latter with special effects that appeared to reveal the dreams of a person asleep. The result was indeed magical. The idea grew out of popular diorama and panorama visual entertainments of the 18th and 19th centuries that aspired to achieve lifelike special effects. Today, we might think back to the thrill of the first time seeing a film in an IMAX theater to imagine what people thought of dissolving views. As with many inventions of the past, identifying the precise who, what, and when defining the origins of dissolving views isn't simple. The earliest developments can be traced to the first decades of the 1800s in France and England, but it wasn't until the 1840s that projected dissolving views were popularized. Significant credit is given to Henry Langdon Child for his role, though others may have been responsible for more of the technical innovations. The special projector mentioned in the Apollo Rooms ad, the Bicenoscope, was introduced at the Royal Adelaide Gallery in London in December of 1840. Thus, when Barnum first arrived in England in the winter of 1844, this new form of dissolving views was still a novelty, and he surely must have been anxious to acquire a setup for his museum. Soon enough, with General Tom Thumb's runaway success in London and hefty profits in his pockets, Barnum could afford the princely thousands asked by Professor Swift. Still, Barnum had his limits, and he was a frugal Yankee at heart. While in France, he was busy trying to acquire grand panoramic scenes, certain that they would attract visitors to the American Museum. Painted cloth panoramas and dioramas were designed to make viewers feel they were part of the scene, the virtual reality of that era, and they could be hundreds of feet long, requiring extensive structural setups in the round that controlled viewing in order to heighten the illusion. Although these were not new in America, Barnum had his eye on scenes he thought would be a draw, the Palace of Versailles, and scenes of Napoleon Bonaparte's reinterment, the grand funeral procession as his remains were brought from the island of St. Helena to Paris in December 1840. On August 18, 1845, Barnum wrote to friend Huey, I received a letter from Messrs. Moltini and Company, the opticians and, unfortunately, their demands are too great for me. They ask 10,000 francs for the panoramas, that is to say, 8,000 for that of Napoleon and 2,000 for Versailles. This is quite too much. There is already a panorama existing representing the funeral of Napoleon. It was made somewhere in Paris, and perhaps it is now there and may be bought for a low price. I wish you to try to learn where it is and whether it is for sale. Monsieur Robert Houdon, a physician, magician, is now performing in a salon in the Palais Royal. He knows me. I have bought 4,000 francs worth from him. He can probably tell you where this panorama is, but if you give him my name, perhaps he will try to speculate out of me, so you must manage it as you think best. A Monsieur Lambert in Paris also probably knows where it is. You can get his address by inquiring of Mr. Darche. Music store Rue de Tosse, Montmartre, set. Perhaps Monsieur Darche himself knows where the panorama is. Monsieur Lambert is a friend to Molteni and Company, so it will be better not to mention my name to him at present. Barnum also wrote to Molteni and Company to apologize for the trouble of his previous inquiry, saying he had anticipated the cost to be half the amount they asked. I should not have inquired if I had supposed that the panoramas would cost so much or I could never get back my money by exhibiting them in America. At this stage in our reading of Barnum's letters, I cannot tell you if or how the panorama purchase problem will be resolved. Perhaps Barnum's friend Huey will find out where the other Napoleon panorama is, and Barnum will purchase that one. Or perhaps he will have to commission his own. 
At the very least, we can be certain Barnum will continue to keep his eyes peeled for novel and instructive entertainments to ship back to Mr. Hitchcock, so as to keep up the old American museum that gave me a start in the world. Stay tuned. Thanks for listening to this episode of Becoming Barnum, The Journey to Fame and Fortune. This podcast was produced by the Barnum Museum. All episodes are based on the blog series Barnum's Letters from Abroad by Adrian St. Pierre, curator of the Barnum Museum. Editing and sound design are by Rui Pinna and narration by William Saris. Kathleen Marr is our executive director and John Swing is our chief operations officer. Please visit our website at www.barnum-museum.org to learn more about the museum. Don't forget to connect with us on social media and visit the Barnum Museum's YouTube channel for behind-the-scenes presentations of our fascinating collections and more stories about the legendary showman. Please tune in next time as we continue our adventures in Europe with P.T. Barnum.